Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Infinite Lorcana Podcast, Episode 7. I'm your host, Jeremy Bertironi. With me, as always, is your other host, Zan Sayed. That's right. And, um... That was Jeremy. <laughs> could have been either of us. And we're coming off of the, um... The weekend of the SCG Con, where there were plenty of Lorcana events, there was a 5K on Saturday and a 1K on Sunday, as well as several secret tournaments on Friday. So um, just to tell you guys a little bit about what our weekend was like, we were originally not planning on appearing on Friday, just because even though we're in Atlanta, we had our own jobs and other things to do. Um, I showed up because I was looking to buy some Star Wars Unlimited cards, and like right when I'm in line, the venue is about to open, Somebody's like, no, there's a big event. There's a big event on Friday. So I text Zan immediately. I'm like, hey, there's a big event on Friday. He comes through. He makes it just in time, right as it's starting. He sits down. I already wrote out his deck list. I ran out the office. (laughs) I ran out the office, and I was going to make it there at 12.58. Right. Tournament starts at 1. He gets there. He hands me my deck. I, You know, he has his deck. It's just as the judge is making his announcements. Fortunately, it's a judge we knew. It's Blaylock, um, the Lorcana judge, one of the sort of head deputy Lorcana judges. Um, anyway, come to find out that we were playing just for prize ball tickets, just for fun points. Yeah, it was terrible. I was like willing to get in an accident, whole situation. <laughs> um, and then let's continue on with our weekend. So we played that event. Uh, I think. Zan, did you win out of that event? No, I lost the last round to a player that I'm not remembering right now, but they were playing purple, purple, green, and they top aided both on Saturday and Sunday, that the 5K and the 1K. Wow. So great player. Um, they ended up defeating me. I was playing Pride Lands, Amber Steel, and um, really the matchup comes down to how many... Let the storm rage rage on you. Draw. I ended up drawing one in all three games, mm-hmm. and it really, really cost me. I think I lost the die roll as well, but uh, they played extremely well and and defeated me. And then we went to Gubu Hobbies, which is where we play on our Friday nights. Mm-hmm. I uh, managed to pull the undefeated three zero. Yeah, no, you were you absolutely dominated. What were you playing again? So you finally let me play the uh, green purple deck that I've been like begging to. play. I didn't have the cards, but I got the cards on uh, on uh, Friday. Right, big event, lots of Lorcana cards available for users. Not as many Star Wars cards. Actually, I will comment on that was probably the biggest frenzy for cards that I've ever seen in one of those convention halls. Anybody with a Star Wars card, it was like you had a little gold nugget during. Yeah, before we went to Gubu. I ended up playing some Star Wars with, Jer- with, with Jeremy, but kind of next to Jeremy. Mm-hmm. There's a random fella that wanted to play against me, and so I borrowed Jeremy's Burn Sabine deck and uh, ended up proceeded to proceeded to beat him beat him a couple of times. And I said that the deck was complete garbage and no one should play it. And uh, then what happened? Yeah, so Zan ended up beating this guy so bad with my deck that he looked at me and he was like, you can take the rares out of this deck and I'll buy the rest of it for $85, about three times what it was worth. And I was just like, hey, okay, and I sold it to him. Definitely, uh, you know, I he knew exactly what he was offering too. He looked up all the cards on TCG Player. He just wanted to get, it's so hard to just get the cards right now. A lot of boxes are sold out and stuff. He was just like, I'll just take the shell of this deck. Just give it to me. Uh, it's also one of the only times where I've walked around and I was talking to the vendors and I was like, do you have Star Wars cards? And they were like, not for sale, but we're buying them. I've never heard that before. Like, what even is that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the game is getting popular. It's still set one. There's a demand for it. So they were probably trying to flip it right then and there. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's like one of the green signs for a card game is when stores start se- selling singles. And fortunately, we've reached that threshold for Lorcana. Yeah, Lorcana, a lot of stores have singles. That's just great. Um, let's continue with our weekend. So we go to Gubu. We do our sort of nightly thing. I3-0, I'm, I'm, I'm in my lane because I'm playing an aggressive deck. Um, we try to pretend that play styles aren't real. Or we well, not pretend, but we try to transcend play styles, I think, the two of us. Yeah. Um, but Lorcana is a pretty tough game. And so I just know right now that if I have an aggressive deck, at least I'm going to play it really well. Yeah, if you wanna, if you're trying to play 
and win, you the last thing you want to do is box box yourself into a color because metas are going to shift and your colors are either either going to be great or they're going to be bad and you're going to see both sides. Everything goes comes in a wave, and so my theory has always been play everything because even if you don't like that play style like what what you'll learn is exactly what your opponent doesn't like when you're playing your deck mm-hmm. and it teaches you exactly how to defeat whatever matchup you're struggling against um because you get to see what happens to you and how you react to it and you get to judge like oh that didn't feel good when i was playing that deck and i'm just going to make that i'm going to repeat that for my opponent mhm and so so yeah so I ended up playing yellow steel at Gubu and I went one, two. Right. And I played against my exact 60 two times. Mm -hmm. And then I played against blue steel once. And I just, I felt like there's nothing you can really do if you lose the die roll. Right. And, um, it made me feel really bad, but I also felt good because like, these are my friends. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to improve, but, like I'm giving up tournament equity and I know that. And uh, I was trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do with that. So that, that drive home was kind of brutal because I was thinking about playing another deck that I had been working on, which was Amethyst Steel um, for Saturday. Right. And so we get there Saturday. You play in the Lorcana 5K. I play in the Star Wars 1K um, and then we kind of had, I think, the same day, which is that we both sort of lost matchup lottery super hard. Yeah. Um, why don't you talk about that? Because this is a Lorcana podcast, so just explain to them what we mean when we say that. So round one, absolutely crush it. It's just against purple green. Round two, played against blue red. I felt like I was on the verge of winning the matchup mm-hmm. in game three, and... Uh, they end up just drawing all four be prepared at the perfect moment. And then I was about to mill them out with whole new world. Yep. And uh, they ended up ripping a lucky dime to kill me for exactly 20. When I, when the next turn I was like above 90% to double whole new world. Um, I was one ink away. Either they didn't kill my aerial the turn before and I can double whole new world or they let me ink up to 10 so I could double whole new world and mill them out. And, uh, yeah, they won the die roll. They won the match. Um, and then the, the next round, I ended up playing against ex- the exact 60 card mirror match mm-hmm. and lost the die roll. Ended up losing in a close game of three. And I was one, two. Um, I needed to win out to make top 16, which I ended up doing. Uh, but I ended up getting pretty unlucky and a lot of the opponents that had beaten me ended up losing a lot, especially in the last round and made my tiebreakers kind of like the, the worst in the tournament. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I ended up finishing 18th, um, being one of only two people with the four and two record, not to top 16. So it was kind of a brutal day. And uh, we ended up going to Beer Garden afterwards. But before we did that, I went and watched Jeremy play Star Wars. So my Star Wars tournament was sort of similar. Zan and I, but mostly Zan, built a sort of like a control deck in the in the arena. It's Krennic Green, for those of you interested. And I felt like I, I was walking into the tournament with the Tier 0 deck. I, I was cleanly winning against everything. The only thing I thought would be a problem was not the mainstream aggressive deck, which is Sabine Green, not even the second most popular aggressive deck, which is Leia Red. I was worried specifically about a Sabine Yellow deck because they have a lot of instant speed, uh, or not instant speed, they have a lot of actions that let you attack for more, like sneak attack and waylay. I knew that they would potentially be able to tempo and burn me out. I thought that outside of that deck, which, by the way, is the third most popular aggressive deck in a one-set format, that I would be good to win the event. I told everybody, I'm getting first this tournament. I like, really felt like that was true. Um, and then the deck that I wanted to see most is the most popular deck, Boba. Boba Green, you know? This is the deck that um, top eighted, or there was a top eight that was prominent in like New Jersey or something where eight of the eight slots were Boba, and the number ninth was this Palpatine Green deck. 
So as long as I play against the most popular deck or any deck other than the third most popular aggressive deck, I feel like I'm a lock to win this tournament. Well, lo and behold, I win my first two matches easily. I play against um, some, like, force-sensitive decks. I play against Darth Vader in the first round, and then I play against um, sort of this mid-range Han Solo deck. Uh, and those were cool. They're a little off-meta, and my control deck is sort of a well-tuned machine, so we were able to take them down systematically. Uh, in round two, my opponent famously, in it was game two, they were down a game, and I was, and we had about ten minutes left on the clock. And I was like, hey, um, just so you know, we have to play a little bit faster if you want to finish. They looked at their, ha- their hand, which was two cards. They looked at my hand. And they went, wait, you have eight cards in your hand? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, okay, you win. <laughs> and I was like, right, yeah, of course. Um, and then round three, I play against... Um, so two things happened, and one of which I don't want to dwell on too much, but I'm kind of dealing with like a bad magic or a bad card game curse right now. If my opponent sits down across from me and says something along the lines of, this matchup is terrible for me, or, well, that's the end of my win streak, I feel like I end up in such a black hole. My advice to you is don't believe in any of that superstitious crap. Um, if you start to do that, it will just make your card game experience way more miserable. But Jeremy picked this up before I ever met him. So here we are. And so my opponent sits down across. I don't, I, it's one of those things where I I know I shouldn't believe in it, but once you start, it's really hard to just turn it off. It's like in your head. And that's why I I don't get too much on you about it, but, um, it is what it is. I'm trying to turn it off. He sits down across from me. He looks up. This isn't even someone that knew me from magic or anything. And he just says for no reason, he goes, well, guess my win streak's over at two and oh, and shows me Sabine and the yellow base. And I'm like, uh Oh, this is going to be close. And we had two close games, but I lost both of them. I win the rest of my rounds, except for the one before last, I play against another Sabine yellow deck. Um, uh, that guy beats me in two close ones. He says that I'm the best player he's ever seen, but it was kind of bittersweet because I was mostly out of the tournament at that point. Uh, one thing I will want to say that I enjoyed about Star Wars tournaments is there are no draws. So the top eight was six five ones and two four twos, and I thought that was neat. Um, cool. But so that was the that was my day. I basically. But know, it was still best of three. <laughs> it is still best of three. I basically lost the matchup lottery and. Um, you know, had a had a sad, but you know, the worst day of playing cards is better than the. Yeah, he still had a chance at making top eight, but ended up getting eleventh again on tiebreakers. Yep. Um. Um. Though, like I said, the worst day of playing cards is better than the best day at work. Is something I always like to think to myself. And so Zan and I walked, um, you know, solemnly but whatever to beer garden. Um, so then we went to beer garden and something really special happened. Zan started laying out cards, uh, while we're all eating and drinking at the restaurant. And, uh, he put together this little Amber steel list and then no, no, Amethyst steel, Amethyst steel list. That's right. Amber steel is the main one that you play. Um, put together the list and we looked in on it and made little comments and I kind of came in and said, Oh, I think this might be a tough matchup for you. And you kind of agreed and you made a little change to the deck or whatever. And, yeah, so my my thought process between uh, with uh, Amethyst Steel was to to actually just beat Amber Steel, mm-hmm. and so Ryan, one of our Gubu Gubu friends, um, was sitting across from me, and he was playing my Amber Steel deck. I was like, Ryan, pull out the deck, let's jam. And so Jeremy and Ryan piloted the deck together. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, piloted the deck together, and I was on the opposite side with this, with this deck that I had been working on, but hadn't fully cracked yet. And we were trying to figure out a couple of those slots, and so um, we ended up playing four games. I ended up winning all of them. Yep. We just in testing. What I like to do is um, just alternate no matter who wins. So I think Ryan went first, then I went first, second. He went first third and then I went first fourth yep. and um, I won all four and I was like, I'm not going to put any more testing in. I'm just going to go with my gut. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ended up making one more change before the tournament, which was adding Bubba Boom. And that was just a hedge against Yellow Steel. Again. Sure. And so then I guess spoiler alert, but the tournament went really well. Congratulations, Antayed, the winner of the Sunday yeah, tournament. I ended up winning Sunday. I ended up winning the 1K on Sunday, um, and it was pretty
pretty much a cakewalk. I did lose to Blue Red um, once in Swiss, but ended up just winning out from there. And I ended up playing against Blue Red again in top eight and ended up beating it there. Um, and then I played Purple Steel, oh uh, no, no, Purple Green in the in the finals. Uh, we split top four and then we decided to play it out for... Yeah, to see who wins, and it was, you know, you were the winner at the end. So um, congratulations, and then let's do now our little metagame snapshot for everybody. Talk to me about how does this Amethyst Steel deck fit in? So, uh, I mean, theoretically, I'm probably the worst against Blue Steel, Mm -hmm. but that deck has really gone down in popularity. Right. I haven't been seeing it on ladder at all. I didn't even see one copy in in the tournament on either friday saturday or sunday i don't know what the reasoning for that is it might just be coincidence it could just be like what are you beating with blue steel i've always wondered that about the deck like like i think the the synergy between fishbone quill and a whole new world is great but against ruby amethyst they're really kind of going to be fast against you amber steel has sort of the same types of similarities and you you know you have a tough time and um, so I think the argument against Blue Steel would be, like, what are you really happy to see? And it I just seems like a 50-50 against every everything. single everything. Yeah. Except for, I mean, my Yellow Steel Pride Lands matchup was insane. Right. Like, above 75% over 60 to 70 matches. I was not losing to that matchup at all. So you're a 50-50 against everything, but you can't beat Zan Syed in the tournament. <laughs> Yeah, so with if you're playing yellow steel, yeah. Um steel. So that theoretically is my worst matchup. I know in set 2 I played Amethyst Steel, mm-hmm. but it was like a bigger deck and Blue Steel just completely smushed you because you just couldn't beat um what's the clock guy's name? Cogsworth. Cogsworth. You couldn't beat the Cogsworth and they just kind of gummed up the board by playing like Tinkerbells and all that stuff. And nowadays they are more the Tamatoa package. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Tamatoa is really difficult for Amethyst Steel to deal with. You kind of have to like either double along came Zeus it or you have to tap it down and use Fox, uh, Madame M Fox plus uh, Madame M Crab to to deal with it. And it's it's really difficult. Um, But the thing that I like about this deck is that it can win against anything because your curve kind of stops at five and you have a lot of incidental lore gain, right? You're playing two spell books. You're playing the four goats, the bounce package, but you have Robin hood, right? And Robin hood, um, five, it, you can shift it onto the one drop on three. And if it, if it, um, banishes a character, you gain two lore. And so the thought process is like you're just gaining a bunch of incidental lore. And Smi is kind of like the secret sauce of like gaining lore super, super fast. And then, of course, you have uh, Castle, the the OP purple location that gets you a ton of lore as well. And so what I kept finding myself was like this is a purple red deck that kind of finishes the game up quicker. Yeah, a little right? bit faster. And you don't get up to that six mana spot and oftentimes you just stop inking after five i love decks where you can stop after five and so i felt like it kind of feel it kind of plays like the purple green deck Mm -hmm. except for like less it has more playability to it because it has a more definitive answer with along came zeus so we're sort of in that aggro space, but we have a little bit better answers. That probably makes us a little better in the mirror right? or in aggressive mirrors, right? It's easy for you to win the aggressive mirror because you have the amethyst package, which is so good at taking out yeah. glimmers, uh, characters. And then you have the, you know, the steel package, which is also really good at taking out characters. I mean, it's you're just great, in a great, but I don't play like, uh, grab your swords, right? right. So I can have a tough time dealing with, bunch of small dudes but what i use is i play three pinocchios and i just tap everybody's dudes and just kill them whenever i need to kill them Mm -hmm. but um i think one of the biggest perks for me is that i felt like there were 
it was very unlikely that I was going to play against him in a match. Sure. And so this is, I think, one of my kryptonites is I, I feel like I have a, such a he- massive advantage when my opponent doesn't know how to play around, play against me. Mm-hmm. And even if my deck is like maybe one or two percent less, them not knowing how to navigate against me, I can kind of use that against them uh, better than most players. And that that was one of the reasons why I wanted to switch it up because I felt like if I played against Yellow Steel, what would happen? And that's exactly what happened. I played against my 60 and I beat the crap out of it. They call it the uh, Brewer's Advantage, Zan, is when you ha- they don't know your list, but you know theirs. Okay, so then for the rest of the metagame snapshot, I feel like it's a little tough for us this week because right now I think Lorcana's wide open. You can sort of play almost anything you want. I I have to disagree. I mean, Cranderson, mm-hmm. Chris Anderson, won the the biggest Lorcana tournament, which was... The uh, 10K. Yep. The Thea Beasties 10K was also going on this weekend. Probably impacted a little bit of attendance at the SCG Con, but that's, I don't know, necessarily a conversation we want to have. But, yep, Chris Anderson won, and what was he playing? He's playing Blue Red. Mm-hmm. He's playing Sapphire, Ruby, Control. And apparently he cakewalked, he cakewalked the top 16. Um, Playing against a lot of Amethyst, no, Amber Steel. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, it's... I think it's a 50-50 matchup, but again, Chris Anderson comes from the Magic world. and Pretty good player. He's a great player and from the Magic world, and it translates well in Lorcana world. I got to say it. I have to say this, and mm-hmm. you're going to think you're gonna think that I'm so small for saying this, but uh, my winning end of the first SCG top eight I ever had was against Chris Anderson. Oh, I... Totally forgot about that. Come on and slam, and I beat him. Oh, well, that that was at um, that was the humans tournament, Cincinnati, and I was playing oh, fish. Dang, yeah. Because we identified that tribal creature decks were so good, but we couldn't get two humans decks together. So I was just like, "Well, I'll just do my best with fish." Yeah, that was a good time. Mm-hmm. That was I a great tournament. In that tournament. Oh, I, I top eight of that tournament. I top eight of that tournament, and and like oh, so weirdly accidentally. I remember that day, the whole day. I was like, I'm just so glad I made day two, and I don't have to pay to play into another event. I just get to play this event. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I watched that tournament. Jeremy was playing against an opponent who just did not want to win. He was just like, Jeremy, you can win even without having the win condition. I um that was also the last tournament where I accepted high roll as a way to determine who goes first. That was the last tournament. Yeah, I remember pretty vividly a guy going high roll and then sort of sliding the dice across the table, and they were on twelve the whole time, and they like came to a halt, and I was like, "All right, I'm done. I'm Do figuring something out." Talk about the pros of uh, high roll. High, I mean, uh, even odd over high roll. Sure. So the way that I like to determine who goes first is uh, we can each roll one die. You can call even or odd, and then whatever the sum of those two is, um, we'll do it. The pros are as follows. Um, You can tie with high roll. So theoretically, you could be high rolling against somebody all day as you both can't stop rolling a seven or whatever. Um, So this one, you only have to roll once. And another pro is there's there's nothing you can do to your die to manipulate it that will have any influence on the outcome of the die roll on purpose because even if you can roll a six every time with dexterity or whatever, um, it's still 50 50 if their roll is random. So there's, it's like nobody, like you have an equal chance of affecting the die roll. Um, The only downside I think seems to be that some people aren't used to it and you might have to deal with what happens when somebody isn't used to something and you're playing a card game against them, which is understandably they could, not trust that it's going to be fair for whatever reason. Um, but I just made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to high roll anymore. So that's how I like to roll dice. Yeah. I mean, we also know that Lorcana has a die roll advantage. Mm-hmm. And so people are very incentivized, especially in money, uh, events for money um, on the line you to, to cheat the roll. And we know that high roll is manip- like something that you can manipulate, mm-hmm. right? You should try it yourself, right? Like if uh, if you roll a, if you roll a snake eyes, try to roll something higher than a snake eyes. Uh, 
really that difficult. Right. You just have to flip them. And especially if those chess X dice that come, um, it's like 12 to a box, the like kind of bigger ones. I'll be honest with you is to prove to myself that I could do it. I spent an afternoon just trying to roll high on the big chess X dice. It's really easy. They have a high side and a low side. I mean, it's like simple to do it actually. It, it, it really is. And I really noticed that playing in a ton of tournaments that people were doing it a lot. Mm -hmm. a lot and we were all just pretending that the person who rolls second doesn't have a major advantage um or disadvantage right because they're either the person who rolls first is like trying to do it and then the second guy gets to flip it or many ways yeah it's 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 horrible it's not a game you want to play trust me don't i don't make two people do it because i i found that that explanation take for some reason doesn't latch on for people sure so i just say hey you can roll the dice and i'll call it or i can roll the dice and you yeah can call it. that makes sense to me i i just you know the what we've invented with the even odd we each roll one is like the platonic ideal of a die roll so i just can't stray from that yeah basically i want to get to that point once people accept even or odd yeah then they'll then, be able to accept even or odd we each roll one yeah so i mean i would say that you're probably much better at convincing people of this mm-hmm and it's a really hard sell sometimes. But for me, I was like, I felt like I was zero percent to persuade someone to do two because they get stuck on the odds and they don't realize that the odds are the same. They um, so this is an interesting conversation. I want to zoom out a little bit because this is a conversation that a lot of people would like roll their eyes at or not be interested in having. Um, but we we're trying to like prepare people for the tournaments and Lurkana's in another weird spot because people want Lurkana to be this like. It's a Disney game. We're all here to like have fun and enjoy these, you know, wonderful characters and all these wonderful things. Um, but then it's also a trading card game, so that comes with like a certain amount of this territory. And so what happened this past week is, I don't know if you're aware of this, there was a big discourse on X.com. Twitter. Twitter.com. Mm-hmm. Do you know about the Twitter drama? Uh remind me again. I so somebody somebody remember. tweeted and they basically said, What if you have in play a Cogsworth that has yeah. ward? Mm-hmm. And they have some creatures in play. Yeah. And they play, in, and and this is at a set championship. Mm-hmm. So we're playing for a stitch. They play a let it go. And they say, oh. targeting your Cogsworth. Yeah, yeah. The reality of what the like rules as written say needs to happen is, you call a judge, the judge comes over, you tell them what happened, and the judge makes them let it go one of their own creatures. Because the way casting spells works, in, in or casting actions works in Lurkana is... You announce that you're paying, or you announce that you're playing the spell, and then you pay for it, and then you select targets. So since Let It Go can legally target your own creatures, that's the part that they wind up to, or they rewind to. The judge has to make you your own creature. And you have a big discourse, because there's people that want to play this sort of like honorable game, and they say, hey, if you need to resort to that kind of thing to win at Lorcana, then I don't want to play with you. But then you have other people that are like, hey, I'm just trying to play by the rules and and we're playing for money and I think that we should all agree on what the rules are. Yeah. Um, and so these discourses are happening. And then what's your what's your opinion on on that? First of all, the discourse, and second of all, what do you think you do in that situation? Oh yeah. I remember seeing that. I didn't put very much thought into it. Okay. Uh, but I will think about it right now. Um in the moment, I feel like I mean I feel like rules are made to be rewritten Mm -hmm. that end up being the best case scenario. So I don't think that whatever the rule is should like stay if we found a better solution. Sure. I think that adapting, especially at this early stage is a good thing. Yeah. So, um, but I do think that whatever the rules are at that moment is the way that things should happen. Mm hmm. And there should be discourse so we can find the best way to deal with it. I think that if it is an F and M event, like which is which I think should be like F and M being like a Friday, uh, Lorcana event. Sure. Right. There should be events that are classified as beginner friendly, and there should be events classified as like in Magic, this pro level events, mm-hmm. right? And we just have to establish when the the chess like rules and pro level rules go into effect 
Because when people are playing for money, yep, there needs to be a rule set that um, that happened. But we're, when we're when we're thinking about this, we're always thinking about an extreme. We're thinking about the newest player in the room mm-hmm. or a child. And at bigger beginner level events, I feel like that is where people should have an opportunity to learn. Sure. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, that's just. So my take on it is there's a there's a there's a part of magic rules in fractions that I hate. I really hate this. It's when if your opponent misses a trigger, um, the judge then looks at you and they say, do you want to put this trigger on the stack? Mm-hmm. I never think it should be up to me because I'm their opponent right now. So, of course, my, my mechanical in-game answer is no. So I'm weighing that answer up against some sort of bizarre morality. You know what I mean? Which I hate, right? Do I do I want to put my dark my opponent's dark confidant trigger on the stack? Why is it up to me? There should be a hardline rule for it. And people on twi- uh, people on Twitter were sort of saying that in Lorcana it's the same way. The judge is going to come up and say um, the way the rules work are they're going to have to target their own creature. Um, do you want them to target their own creature, uh, or can they just put it back in their hand? And my like. My strong stance on all that discourse is it shouldn't be up to the opponent when the when the when I completely agree. It shouldn't be up to the opponent at all. Why would you make me feel bad about this? I didn't make that I didn't make that guy play let it go. Just just I want the rules to work however they work. If the guy gets to take it back, whatever, that's fine. He can take it back. I don't mind at all. I legitimately don't. Um yeah, and the, the player taking the blame is not not okay. Because it right. it made the experience for the players way worse. So you have Brendan DeCandio saying that he thinks that you're not good enough to win the match if you don't let them take back the let it go. And I'm just like losing my mind on why it would ever be your choice. It shouldn't. It yeah. should be the the rules should be up. Once the judge is involved, mm-hmm. the rules should be upheld by the judge. Right? And the rules. Mm-hmm. Not by the opponent being the like, opponent. you... Like we can play an imaginary game because it will be better for your experience. Like the what? Like then you just ruined your own experience, right? Because you have a choice of, like, <laughs> like not playing by the rules. Just like it, it's confusing. Like wh- wh- why are we doing the song and dance? Because with- yeah, my answer was I would love if I could just call a judge. And they come over and I say whatever you say. Yeah, you know, but in that particular situation, if you go by magic rules, that's an illegal target. So right. they should be able to... They can't cast the spell. They can't cast the spell. So it, that whole discourse should never happen. Right. The reason that it... Yeah, and in Lorcana, casting a, casting a card works different. I know. I, I've noticed on Lorcana, there's been times where I've been like, I haven't even selected the target. But you're I've, locked in to cast. But I'm spell. locked in to cast the spell, and it's cost me because I was just playing on autopilot just to test mm-hmm. uh, a large number of matches, and I was like, okay, like I don't like that. Like I think that until until I say, hey, I'm casting this spell this particular way, like either singing it or whatever, and I'm doing it on this. At that moment, it's declared. Like the chess piece has moved, mm-hmm. and it makes total sense that I'm locked in. But if I'm trying to decide the target, why am I locked in? Couldn't tell you. Um, and that's and what spe- happens on people especially water. in the game Lorcana, where they can't even do anything on your turn. So it's I think that you know, there's no like, advantage. They should be able to take a lot of stuff back in Lorcana. Exactly. Truly so is what I believe. So in terms of this, I I, I think that. Um, I think that like you should be able to take this back. Yep. Yeah. I, I think if we if we're going for how we wish the rules worked, I think my opponent should go, All right, let it go your cogworth. I go, You can't, it has a work. And he goes, Oh, my bad. And then they take the card back. Yeah. And, I mean, that, <laughs> and that's happened to me in tournaments. Oh, of course. What I would deem pro level tournaments, and I've been like, Yeah, it's fine, you can't do that. Right. In 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 magic it's pretty different because I could have had a counter spell and you could be like checking me. You know, but in Lurkana, you can't. So just like, I always tell them, I go, figure out what you want to do is literally a phrase I've said to my opponents a lot, which yeah. in Lurkana, which is me just saying like. So I will say in, 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 in magic, there is a lot of variance slash luck involved mm-hmm. because you have lands and you can get land screwed. So every count card that is a real card, you're counting it 
and like trying to maximize every advantage you can possibly get. And Lorcana, when like that's really rare, rarely the case. Mm-hmm. Honestly, this game is much simpler but more complicated, so you can gain a massive edge elsewhere. You don't have to do rules lawyering at all. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of edge to be gained in Lurkana. So if you're if you're winning, you don't need to feel like you need to do any of this stuff in order to win at all. Like you there's so much more improvement that you can have in your games that you don't need to result resort to like this type of shenanigans. Let's move on from this just because I feel like we've said what we wanted to say. Yeah. And um, there's one thing I really want to give our listeners, which is an insight into you building uh, decks in Lorcana. Oh, cool. Um, there was a moment at uh, you know Beer Garden on Saturday night, which is a you know restaurant in Atlanta, um, where you're laying out the Amethyst Steel deck, um, and I feel like I really had a great idea of what all was going on. And when you posted the list on Twitter, um, somebody asked a question that I think doesn't make sense to us as deck builders. But I get why they asked. And what they asked was, why aren't you playing the a whole new world Jafar package? Right? And this is basically if the Jafar's tapped, if you whole new world twice or whatever, that's like 14 lore in a turn. It's a really powerful sort of in game for the Amethyst Steel like possibility. Um, but that wasn't a question that ever really occurred to me and you. And so I was hoping you could firstly steel man the Jafar package, yeah. explain why someone would want to play it. Because I think. That when I when I heard that person say that, I said, "How can you ask that without presenting the argument?" Like I don't know why we would play it. Yeah. Um. So I was hoping you could present that argument and then talk about if you thought about it in building. I know that you did, and then talk about why it doesn't make the cut. Yeah. So first off, I'm gonna say that I get where that person was coming from, mm-hmm. and the reason why I know that is because that was my question week one. How good is Jafar Steel? Right. Right at week one, um, Kendall and I were testing it separately, and like we came to the conclusion. Well, Kendall still believes that a version of that deck is gonna be the best deck. Mm-hmm. Um, after after my testing with it for a week, I was like, I have enough data to say that this this combo is not like viable as a top tier deck. I do think that that Jafar combo is specifically good against one matchup. That matchup is... Um, it is um, Purple Red. Okay. And uh, it's because they don't play like Dracon- Draconic Roar. Yep. And uh, they have a tough time dealing with like Jafar on four, Jafar on five, whole mm-hmm. world. And they lose to that. The card you mean is Dragonfire, but that's I true. I mean Dragonfire, sorry. Yeah. Um, so... So I, I do think it lines up well there, but if you think about all of the any of the steel decks, it's pretty rough, right? Right. Uh, specifically, along came Zeus. Mm-hmm. So I ended up playing in the tournament, the eight K where I played Steel Song. I completely I, I played against a person who ended up top sixteening. I think playing the Jafar version. Okay. And I beat them two zero, and then afterwards they wanted to play some more. So I think I played three more ma- three more games with them. After, oh my gosh! And I beat them like twenty lore to zero every time. Every time. Oh my god! Like my opponent was like, "Oh, you're just getting lucky," and I was so confused because like Ariel is a consistent thing. Yeah, you're playing like one of the more consistent decks. So it's like tough to be like, it's tough to play against Amber Steel and be like, oh, you're high rolling. Because Amber Steel can't really high roll. You can high roll a little bit. If I grind you out and then you rip the a whole new world, that's like, I, I guess, high rolling. But other than that, you're not really high rolling with that. Yeah, deck. every, every even when your aerial bricks, you are, you are making it closer to your original game plan. Mm-hmm. So it it's got to be one of the decks that sees more of its cards than any other deck Mm -hmm. Um, and being able to still play them because even if you're the one who is experiencing whole new world from your opponent they're the one who is generally taking more advantage of it because they get they cast the whole new world when it's most advantage 
advantageous advantageous for them, for them yeah and so um so hence if you think about whole new world is the reason why i built the version that i have now is because it has to do with your curve right your curve i don't want my, i'm not playing tinkerbell i'm not playing yizma i'm not playing uh elsa and why i'm not playing those cards because the curve needs to be below five which makes me be able to take advantage of someone else casting whole new world that's right Yes, makes total sense to me. Um, I like it. And so I would just implore um, people who are just getting into into these games to when they want to know why a person isn't playing something, first make an argument for it, then see what cards you would cut for it. I mean, that's sort of always the big argument is you can't just recommend cards in, you know, we can't play 100 cards. So you have to recommend cards in, cards out. What cards are missing? How does that change your game plans against certain key players in the metagame? I think a lot of the times asking yourself those questions is going to help you find your answer for why a card is in a deck. Yeah. And like the biggest thing is like, you like, it's not about the card alone. Mm -hmm. This is, this is what we mean by the meta is like all the cards interacting with each other at the same time. So important. So if you think about the game as in like, okay, there are five decks right now. I'm likely to, and you think about all of the interactions like a web with each other, mm -hmm. then you then you can kind of figure out, okay, this card, which is as a blank piece of cardboard, like just that card is good in a certain meta, is not good in, in this meta. Mm -hmm. And so a great example of that is Beast, mm -hmm. right? So Beast, the 3-5 five for 5 steel card, that draws you a card if uh, if it has no damage on it. Why is that card? Why why does it not fit? It doesn't fit because when you look at the steel decks in this giant web, um, they have a long came Zeus. You have mm -hmm. this four mana card that someone can sing for free, basically, yeah, to kill it. Mm -hmm. Then you look on the other side and you're like, okay, red, Madame Medusa. Madame Medusa. She loves beast. <laughs> she loves killing that beast. So, like, when you think about it like that and you start seeing the web, it, the web can only become clear by understanding all the interactions that exist. And the only way you can do that is by getting reps. Or I've met people who can just listen to a lot of people who do a good job at creating this web in their mind and speaking about it. Right. And they create that web um, by, like, listening to other experts so by you listening to this and me talking about the web now you kind of will start to create your own web hopefully and then it will help you build decks i like to characterize it why isn't the three six robin hood the best card in the game because it has nightmares about maui <laughs> it's just like dreaming <laughs> kicking in its sleep about Maui. yeah so that's a complicated card mm -hmm. right like if i just think about it i'm like okay why do we play that card? It dies to Madame Medusa. It gets destroyed by Madame Mim. Mm -hmm. um, and then you think about it like this. It's like, okay, here's the web of things. Anything that doesn't have red, it's amazing against. If their primary removal is steel or just purple. It's great with six toughness. It's amazing because it dodges along came Zeus. But the other half, if you're playing against red, Madame Medusa, Maui, it's not as good. But against Maui, you think about it like, okay, if I play it this way, then how do I take advantage of it, right? I shift it, mm -hmm. and then they Maui it. I draw a card. You draw the card. And then now I get to make a card that wasn't playable before in the purple-red matchup or the blue-red matchup, like Storm or Grab Your Sword, work against that Maui, mm. right? And so it becomes a more complicated web of interactions. Sure um right all right so i mean there's a little bit of insight into deck building we talked a little bit about the twitter discourse which is always i mean always honestly a lot of fun we should talk about another really important discourse. i was gonna ask what what else you had it's a beach it's a beach discourse so right now i'm looking at the leaderboard of all the players on uh, the ranked leaderboard for pixelborn the hardcore yeah looking at the hardcore ranked matchup 
I see number one, Zan Syed with 1580. I have reclaimed my throne. About 30 points ahead of the next player. And then number three is Savich, someone coming at you. Somebody who was neck and neck with you for a long time. Talk a little bit about what you want to say about I mean, it. he's an absolutely wonderful, godly player. Mm-hmm. Um, but I heard through the grapevine th- that um, some of my friends watched the stream and he was saying that he was only going to play if I was ahead. Hardcore, right? Because he was sitting on first. So at the beginning of today, I was sitting at one. Then uh, he started streaming. I was at work. And on my way back from work, I had a friend uh, text me being like, hey, Savich is, um, what do you call it, ahead of you now. Um, and this kind of like a challenge going down. A good YouTube content, etc. cetera. And uh, so, yeah, I took him up on it. Got back home from work. Jammed one. Uh, took my spot back at 1580 ELO on Hardcore. And um, then I think we ended up watch Jeremy and I ended up watching him play um, on, on the Hardcore ladder and lose. Um, but I think that uh, that was like closer to the end of his stream. So I think that he'll probably come back tomorrow. Yeah. Stronger. Um, so yeah, Zan, neck and neck, kind of exciting. The top two Lorcana players consistently, consistently. The Veach and Zan, sort of neck and neck, always a, always a pleasure, always fun to watch, something like that. Uh, a little frenemy rivalry thing, would you say? I mean, have, have you guys ever interacted with each other? No. I mean, I saw him and he was in the Magic MPL, but we were g- grinding on in the SUG at the time. Mm. So um, I saw, I, I like, I've heard of him, um, and, I've, and I know he played Hearthstone, but we were kind of in parallel universes, so this is kind of... I mean, Lorcana is better than Hearthstone, better than Lor- uh, better than Magic. It's the best card game in the world right now. Yeah, and so I mean, it makes sense that you know worlds are colliding. Worlds are colliding. You know, when I was playing Magic: The Gathering on the SCG tour, I loved playing against MPL guys. Oh yeah, I think I was like undefeated against them. Yeah, I mean, I was somewhere up there with you. Yeah, I mean, it just it just felt like the narrative really suited me because it was like I'm like this sort of like hungry like new guy on the on the block and they're like establishment sitting up in their ivory towers in the MPL or MPL or whatever and so just beating them always felt like so good to me. I mean let's talk about the truth of the matter though. If like magic was great mm-hmm. but Lorcana is way more skill testing. So if you play against a magic pro in Lorcana what you what what you're going to start to realize is that's when you see who has the more skill overall because this game has so much skill expression in a much more simple, no bullshit type of way. It's tough. I mean, sometimes it takes away a little bit from... I don't I don't have easy turns in the late game. That's why I like the green-purple deck, to be honest with you, is because I feel like, ooh, I played that game perfect. It's like, really, what happened? I was like, I killed my opponent. Thank you. Yeah, because your mission at... And almost 99% of the time is like, can I like inch my way there? Mm-hmm. Like your opponent's always like has turned the corner and you're like, oh my God, please like, just give me the goat. Yeah. Give me the goat. <laughs> I'm at 18. Give me the goat and I'll win. Yeah. That's the best. What's I better mean, than that? I mean, you could say like playing well consistently and winning. Yeah. Um, all right, well, we're at time. If there's anything else, you can do a shout out. Shout out to Mono Green Star Wars deck. All right, yeah, Zan's experimenting with the uh, Mono Green Palpatine builds. Um, make sure you join Club Lorcana, which yep. is our Discord for Lorcana. We have like 600 plus members now. If you want to get better, if you want to talk to me or other like minded people about deck building or whatever your questions are, just join it and like join the community and let's uh let's build some cool ass decks together. All right, and I'm also gonna shout out this new Star Wars game is a lot of fun, and I'll see you guys in Club Lurkana. And you can find me on Twitter at Mox Jeremy. That's M O X J E R E M Y. Uh, a lot of the Lurkana personalities that I beat on Pixelborn are starting to follow me, so you don't want to be behind them. What's your TikTok again? Uh, TikTok is Mox Jeremy as well. Cool beans. Follow follow my man, and uh, I will see you guys next time. Bye.